If you're a quail hunter, the last couple of years, by definition, you've been a frustrated quail hunter. Our quail populations across most of the Bob White's range, even in traditional strongholds like here in West Texas, have been on the slide for the last 20 years. But here in West Texas, it's been the last three or four years, it's been especially problematic. We typically think that our quail populations here in Texas rise and fall, boom and bust on about a five year cycle, probably tied to El Nino, La Nina weather patterns. We were due for a boom population in 2010. We saw no such boom population. Our quail populations the last three years have been record lows each year. Now if we look back to 2011, it's no mystery. Hot, dry, no wonder we didn't grow any quail. But if we look at 2010, the weather was perfect. Anytime you can grow dry land cotton, you ought to be able to grow a quail crop. We had a bumper cotton crop in 2010, really no rebound in our quail. That caused us here at the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch to say, is there something we're missing? Is there something we've overlooked? The whole aspect of disease and quail management has been dismissed by professionals really since Herb Stoddard did his work back in the 1920s. Now, if you go to the local coffee shop or go to quail hunters, you know, if there's not any quail, they'll be quick to assign the blame to something like coccidiosis. We've all, always been quite arrogant and uh, dismissing that, but we really don't have much data to, to either dismiss or accept it. And so our board got together in 2010 and said, Rollins, get serious about this quail decline. Get serious about diseases. And so we had a little over $2 million in our bankroll. They said commit $2 million of it to studying disease and parasites in quail populations. So we got together with eight different projects going on. Uh, researchers from Texas Tech, from Texas A&M, from Texas A&M Kingsville. Brought these people together, had a little get together and said, what do we know and not know about diseases and parasites? Why did we get interested in disease? As a student of quail and a lifelong quail hunter here in the Rolling Plains of Texas, we used to have blue quail over all of this area. I was raised in southwestern Oklahoma and blue quail were our drought insurance. If it was hot and dry, we might not have grown many Bob Whites, we still had the blue quail. In 1988, and I would be so specific as to say between Thanksgiving and Christmas 1988, the blue quail disappeared, literally disappeared from vast areas of the Rolling Plains of Texas. As a biologist, as a scientist, I cannot explain such a widespread demise if I ignore disease. That's the only way I can say something happened. Don't know what. We, uh, I went quail hunting in December of 1989, shot some blue quail in Ozona, Texas, and the livers of them looked like pickle loaf. I didn't get too concerned about it. I didn't have my antennae app. I took some photos of it, threw them away. But after that, I noticed that quail, blue quail had disappeared across most of West Texas. Now fast forward into 2009, 2010, our quail populations, our bob white populations, unexpectedly low. We'd already started some research here at the research ranch looking at parasites. And one of the things we discovered was an abundance of eye worms, worms that get in around the eyeball of quail, record high levels. Okay, so that could be causing a problem. If you're a quail, and you're scratching at your eye, you're not paying attention to that Cooper's hawk over there, could be causing, contributing to the decline of quail. We started these studies in 2011 with what we call Operation Idiopathic Decline. Idiopathic just being medical jargon for the doctor don't know. And we admitted that we don't know for sure what's going on. So we studied, we started these studies uh, with uh, looking at viruses of, of quail, looking at bacterial diseases, various parasites, contaminants, really looking at taking a comprehensive look at the, at the disease component of quail, working with colleagues from Texas Tech, from Texas A&M, the vet school at Texas A&M, Cesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute, bringing together a team of professionals to give this a very comprehensive examination of disease and parasite factors in Texas quail. The Rolling Plains Quail Research Foundation is already committed $2 million to the Operation Idiopathic Decline. And now that we're start talking about phase two, they've committed another half million dollars. None of that money is taxpayer dollars. None of it is, is from a state game agency. It all came from private donors, from concerned quail hunters. And, and we've got a lot of people watching this. Now we're not saying that 
habitat is not important. We're not saying that weather is not important. We're just offering up this disease as, a, as an X factor and as an alternative hypothesis. And we've got a lot of people watching us. And as, as we begin to see more results, I think you're going to see more people from further east want to become partners with us. The economic impact of quail hunting is another angle to this whole quail decline story. As the quail have declined, the economic opportunities for a lot of these struggling West Texas rural communities has also been impacted. Places like Albany and Aspermont and Roby, these places used to receive a real infusion of cash come the hunting season. As the quail have cratered, so has those opportunities to raise money from that. And quail hunters in Texas spend an average of about $10,000 per person in pursuit of their hobby, quail hunting. About 65% of that's spent in the local communities. So if you can imagine every time you see an orange cap and a dog trailer coming in town, that's $6,000, that local community, that is a great economic input. And we've got to be able as, hopefully, to restore that as we increase the quail populations. Okay, so let's move back to 2010. Again, we should have had a great quail year. Weather was really conducive to good quail. Some people were seeing quite a few quail early and then they disappeared. One of the hypotheses you hear talked about here in West Texas is the boll weevil eradication program, some of the various uh, insecticides that have been used in crop production. And again, make a little bit of sense if you've ever seen a field that was sprayed with something like parathion and you see a dead quail at the end of the road. But there's so much of West Texas that is too far away from a cotton field and there's very few quail in those situations too. So again, trying to find a hypothesis that's omnibus that goes across the board is really difficult. And if you've lived in this area and hunted quail for long, a lot of times you hear something to the idea that all oh, the dove hunters got to quail. We had a lot of quail when we were out there Labor Day, come opening day, they weren't around anymore. Is there a pattern there? And is there any biological significance to that? So when we started sampling and designing our sampling scheme for this disease study, we wanted to try to sample before and after that Labor Day time frame. So here we've got 20 different study ranches that we're working with in West Texas. We're also working with the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation on 10 of their wildlife management areas. 30 different study sites across the rolling plains of Texas and Oklahoma. We sample quail in August. We sample quail in October. Hopefully if there's something operational there, if it's some kind of virus going through or whatever, we'll be able to get on top of it and catch it and find that situation and be able to isolate what's going on. So here's what our design is. We have teams that go out onto these different study sites. In August, we trap quail for two and a half days on those properties with the goal of trying to catch 30 quail. Every fifth quail, we euthanize. We sacrifice that bird. It goes into the cooler. That bird is going to wind up being having a complete stem to sturm necropsy done on it. We're going to be looking for parasites, we're going to be looking at the liver, brain tissues, the whole gamut. Every quail we take out of those traps, we're taking tracheal swabs, cloacal swabs, taking tissue samples that are going to be submitted to the vet school at Texas A&M, looking for viruses using the latest molecular diagnostic techniques, using the latest high-tech practices to be able to try to screen and hopefully isolate uh, various viruses. We're looking for a half dozen different viruses, about 10 different bacteria, several different protozoa parasites. Given these things really the old full meal scan as far as what could possibly happen in the quail. Looking at their brain tissues, do we have problems with pesticides, with contaminants? So really a very comprehensive look. And hopefully, as we go through these studies and go through these quail, something is going to surface that says, aha, we may have a problem. One of our initial findings is that the same level of parasitism we were seeing here at the research ranch in Fisher County turns out is happening all across the rolling plains. Half of our quail have these eye worms. One of them had as many as 47. And again, we think that could be a serious problem. Very high parasite loads in the cecum, which is the lower intestine of quail. In Scotland, they found out that grouse that are heavily parasitized 
are more heavily preyed upon by their mammalian predators, red fox in that case. So we want to be able to hopefully study those relationships and then if we find out that there is X, Y, or Z happening, so what? What can we do about it? We're moving now into phase two. Again, studying these eye worms, there is an intermediate host for these eye worms that we think at this point in time is a cockroach. We're going to be doing studies this summer looking at where those cockroaches occur across the landscape and doing molecular tests on them to find out if they have that eye worm DNA in them. Is it just cockroaches? If it is, maybe we can break that, that parasite's life cycle. But if they occur in grasshoppers and crickets, we're going to have to find some other way to attack it. So again, we're still in the early stages, but we're giving it really a very scientific analysis, very comprehensive analysis, and being able to hopefully come up with some answers that will allow us to design some practices that we can hopefully turn the situation around, stop the bleeding here in West Texas. If we find out what's causing the decline, then hopefully be able to d develop a system that we could move that quail population back into its historic range further east.